Matthew hit the gas, and the police siren stayed somewhere far behind. The young man smiled satisfactorily. Never before had he been caught. In principle, he didn't really need to run. Dad would always bail him out. But that was so boring. Usually, when the cops chased him, they ran the plates, saw who the car belonged to, and fell back. But this time, they seemed unusually persistent. Matthew even thought they might be some out-of-towners. He wasn't sure, but he even thought he heard gunshots. Of course, that was complete nonsense, so he didn't pay any attention to it. The only thing that really bothered him about this adventure was that he might have messed up the car's appearance. When he peeled away from the bar, the police immediately got on his tail, so to gain a few meters, Matthew cut through the park. He often did that. He knew exactly where the benches were, where the paths were, so he dimmed the headlights and floored it. Something must have gotten in the way today, something that shouldn't have been there. Most likely, it was one of those trash bins that stood by each bench. But no big deal, he'd check it out when he got there. The sound of police was already gone, and Matthew headed home. It was three in the morning, and all the windows of the house were lit. Strange, what happened? Matthew found his phone in his pocket. Wow, 24 missed calls from Dad. He dialed the number immediately, but before he could even ask anything, his father yelled into the receiver. Where are you? Matthew, you jerk, where are you? Dad, why are you shouting? I just pulled up to the house. Turn around immediately. You can't go home. Long story short, hit the gas. Remember where our grandma's house was? In the village, right? Yes, Matthew. Step on it. Fly there as fast as you can and wait for me. Hide the car. Dad, I'm not going to the village. Why would I? His father yelled like Matthew had never heard before. If you don't want to, don't. You'll rot in jail. Idiot. You hit someone in the park. Matthew didn't ask anything else. He sharply turned the car around and raced out of town. His palms were sweaty. His heart was pounding so hard it reverberated in his ears. So, it wasn't a trash can after all. It was someone he simply hadn't seen without the lights. Damn, just what he didn't need. And what now? I wonder how badly it's damaged. And who was even there? Matthew finally remembered the name of that village. The city was behind him. He pulled over to the side, punched the name into the GPS, and hit the gas again. Wow, over a hundred kilometers, but in his car, it would take less than an hour. Although, he wouldn't drive fast. Screw it, he already got lucky once. His father called about an hour later, when he was almost at the village. Where are you? Almost there. Dad, what happened? Oh, Matthew, why did you run? Dad, I didn't know, I didn't see. Anyway, that guy, he's in the hospital. I threw some money there, the prognosis seems good. How did you find out? Well, that guy wasn't alone. He was walking his girl. How did I not see them? Anyway, until everything's cleared up, you'll stay in the village. You need to pay that girl too. And besides, Uncle Nathan said to lay low. Uncle Nathan is dad's brother, though a cousin. He was the deputy chief of police, so Matthew got away with everything. Plus, he had been friends with the police chief's daughter since childhood. Okay, Dad, got it. Can I live in that house? I don't know. Nobody's been there for about five years. You'll figure it out. Do you have money? Got it. I withdrew some cash at the gas station. There was an ATM there. All right, then. Don't call yourself. I'll dial. 
Dad, what about Mom? What do you think? Got it. Mrs. Anna loved her only son Matthew dearly, but her love for hysterics, depression, and scandals was no less. Mrs. Anna came from a good family. Her father was a famous violinist in his time. He had a huge number of awards, government honors. Her mother never worked but led quite an active social life, instilling the same attitude in Anna from an early age. She got married late. Matthew's father fell in love with Anna when she was only 20, and she agreed to marry him only when she was 27. Meanwhile, Mr. Percy came from the village. However, after some time, Mrs. Anna forbade her husband even to mention this detail of his biography. Percy's mother was taken from the village, but the woman couldn't live in the concrete jumble for long, so now only Matthew and his parents remained in the house. His maternal grandmother lived in her own apartment, which the state had given to her father. Dad had a very successful business. Not always legal, but to settle things, they had that same Uncle Nathan. There was plenty of money in the family. However, Mrs. Anna was still dissatisfied. She wanted more. And Mr. Percy tried. On his 25th birthday, he gave Matthew a new car. He had been eyeing it for a long time, but hadn't said anything. He knew that this SUV was very expensive. In the morning, when he saw the car outside his bedroom window, he jumped out of bed and ran to his parents. He hadn't hugged them like that in ten years. Even the constantly dissatisfied Mrs. Anna broke into a smile and hugged her husband. See, our son is on cloud nine. Mr. Percy also smiled. He'd be better off with a brain. A couple of kilograms. Matthew pulled up to the house. The sky was already brightening, and Matthew could see the house well. Oddly enough, it didn't look abandoned. On the contrary, it looked big, beautiful, and mysterious. Matthew opened the gates, drove the car in, pulled out some kind of sheet or blanket from the shed, threw it over the car, and went into the house. He didn't have keys, so he randomly checked under the mat, and miracle, there was a key. It really was a miracle because as soon as the iron gates appeared, his father immediately installed one here. The house smelled of dust, some dried herbs, and strangely, tea. Matthew found the light switch. Well, there's even electricity. He quickly shook the cover on the couch and decided to sleep. Everything else later. He had been partying for two nights. He decided to catch up on sleep on the third and then this. Matthew collapsed without looking for a pillow or blanket, fell asleep immediately. He didn't know how long he slept, but he woke up because the sun stubbornly shone right in his eyes and it was getting hot. Matthew sat up. Damn, he hadn't even thought of going to the store. He really wanted to drink. He went outside. A girl was walking past the gate. Matthew was even amazed. Could there really be real beauties in such a backwater? But Matthew didn't admire the girl for long. Something else caught his attention. The girl on the yoke was carrying two buckets of water. He almost lost consciousness when he imagined how cold and wet the water was. He rushed out of the yard. Girl. Girl. Stop. I'll die without your help. She stopped and looked scared at the young man who came out of the uninhabited house. What happened? Girl, I beg you, let me drink. And Matthew, without waiting for consent, rushed to the bucket. He felt like he drank half of it. The water was icy, deliciously insane. When he felt better, he finally straightened up and looked at the girl. Thank you. You saved me from death. The girl laughed. Who are you? Where did you even come from? The well is right there. 
She pointed with her hand, and Matthew only now realized that the well was indeed three meters from his gate. He laughed too. My name is Matthew. I'm Carly. Carly, can you tell me if there's a store in this village? Of course, there is. We have a very big village. So, you need to go down this street to the end, then turn left. After three houses, turn right again. There will be a path. It's shorter, it goes through the garden. Mrs. has two dogs running around, but don't be afraid, they're not very mean. Then you climb up the hill. Matthew raised his hands. I'm already lost. Maybe you'll go to the store today? I could go with you. Matthew looked at the girl with a pleading look. Carly laughed. All right, I'll escort you. Half an hour later, they were walking to the store. They chatted cheerfully. Carly told Matthew that the people in the village were kind, that at one time the village almost died, and then nothing. People wanted clean air. And now it's hard in the city too, there's almost no work. Matthew listened, and at the same time, he glanced briefly at Carly. At first, he thought she was 18, but now he realized that the girl was older. She was probably 25. Long, almost waist-length hair, braided into a simple braid. A trim figure. Slightly wider hips than usual. But a wasp waist. The girl was tall enough. If Matthew was almost two meters tall, she was taller than his shoulder. Matthew wasn't used to such tall girls. Everyone around him was small. Very skinny, as Matthew himself said, and there was nothing to hold on to. They arrived at the store. It was an ordinary country house. This is the old store, and there's another one over there. That one was recently opened. Some city people. They have a lot of everything. More choice, but also more expensive. Decided. Let's go to the expensive one, where there's a lot of everything. Carly smiled and obediently walked beside him. They had only been to that store a couple of times with Grandma. And even then, they went for some trifle that wasn't in this store. When they walked in, their eyes scattered. There was so much there. And the store itself inside was not like their rural one. Everything was white and glass. Everything sparkled. Matthew let her go ahead, and Carly felt like a real princess. In general, even being near this unusual guy was exciting. Carly had lived her whole life in this village and hadn't really gone anywhere. She went to cooking school right after high school, graduated with honors, and came back here. They lived with Grandma, and the girl couldn't leave her at this age. She worked in the school cafeteria, but not in her own village, but seven kilometers away. In another one. Now, when it was summer, there was no work as usual. So she rarely went to school. And what's the point? She jumped on her bike, and twenty minutes later she was there. And back the same way. It was just harder in winter. But Carly learned to ski for this. And this year... They have two first-grade girls in the village. They say now the school bus will come. And Carly also loved to sing. She sang at all the village holidays. The club was also in another village, but could that stop Carly? Matthew entered behind her, started looking around. Well, it's a bit sparse, of course, but you can buy something. He approached the counter. The saleswoman, a kind woman, asked reluctantly, Admire or buy something? Matthew raised an eyebrow. Is it you talking to me? To you. Who else? Woman, are you the seller here? Well, yes, I'm the seller. Then please perform your duties. Firstly, stand up and come to the counter. Secondly, greet me and be polite. 
Thirdly, you must quickly answer all my questions about the goods I'm interested in. I don't think your boss will be thrilled when he finds out how you treat customers. Carly tensed up. Well, this is the end. Everyone was afraid of this woman, even the dogs hid when she walked through the village importantly. Mrs. Slowly got up, approached the counter, glanced at Matthew, and suddenly smiled. Good day, what can I offer you? Matthew also smiled. First, I need food that doesn't need to be cooked. Well, or just boiled. Actually, I don't know if the refrigerator works, but... Carly, can I ask to use your refrigerator? Mrs. interrupted him. Okay, maybe you'll buy a refrigerator from us too. True, they're very small, almost portable, but it's enough for one person. Carly almost laughed. Well, Mrs. completely gone mad. The man came for sausage, and she's offering him a refrigerator. But Matthew suddenly said, Is there anyone to deliver it? Are you teasing me? We'll take care of everything properly. Then show me your refrigerator. Maybe you have an electric kettle? A stove? Everything is available for such a customer. They spent almost an hour in the store. Carly felt like Matthew bought everything he could, everything that was in the store. He took out his wallet, counted some 5,000 bills, and threw them on the counter. Mrs. counted the change. Carly saw that there were about 3,000 there, but Matthew casually threw it. That's for delivery. Mrs. rounded her eyes, but quickly hid the money in her pocket. Where should we deliver it? Carly turned to her. To Mrs. Ivy's empty house. The woman nodded, called someone. Seems like her husband. Carly remembered that he had a motorcycle with a sidecar. So it'll work out. They returned lightly, and that Matthew suddenly decided to learn more about Carly. Do you live here, or are you visiting? I live here. I've been here since birth. I work at the school. Teacher? No, I'm a cook. Wow, Carly, you can cook? Well, of course. You're my savior. I can't even boil eggs. Carly laughed. How is that possible? You just put the eggs and that's it. They boil themselves. You don't even need to stir. Well, you know. Once I decided to cook eggs for myself. I was at a friend's house. We drank a bit. He doesn't have a maid. So, I found eggs, put them in the microwave, and went to the room to surprise everyone that now I, like a true chef on a ship, will feed everyone. However, before I could finish speaking, there was gunfire from the kitchen, and everyone immediately fell to the floor. Carly was already holding her stomach from his storytelling, and Matthew sighed very tragically. Then the friend, or rather the enemy, made me clean that very microwave. Cleaned it? No, while he was away, I bought him a new one just like it and dirted it a bit. When he arrived, I was honestly scrubbing a little spot. Wow, what a way out. Of course, I'll help you. I'll whip up something. They parted near the gate. Matthew paused for a moment and held Carly's hand in his. I'm waiting for you. Remember, I'm simply dying of hunger. Carly blushed and dashed off, while Matthew, smiling contentedly, headed towards the gate. But as soon as he entered the gate, he heard the rumble of a motorcycle. Peeking out towards the house, he saw a small, stout man unloading packages. Carly arrived an hour later. Matthew immediately noticed that she had dressed up and even applied some makeup. He just wanted to compliment her, but his phone rang. It was his father. Just a moment. He went outside. Yeah. So, did you settle in there? Yeah, everything's fine. 
I even found a store. What's there? Well, the girl of that guy you hit took the money. She'll keep quiet. But the guy himself was pumped out. Turns out he's very ideological. In general, we'll have to resort to extreme measures if we can't come to an agreement. And what? How long do I have to stay there? His father raised his voice. You can come back today, then go straight to surrender. Dad, come on. I just asked. Stay for now. A week, maybe two. I'll call. That's it, let's go. All right. He returned to the house. Carly was already cooking something. It smelled really good. Matthew grabbed a piece of sausage, bread, and flopped onto the couch. Carly, it smells amazing, the girl smiled. You know, I've loved cooking since I was a child, and I always dreamed that someday I'd have my own restaurant. And you gave up on your dream? Well, let's say I've put it off for the indefinite future. After all, I have my grandmother. How could I leave her? Matthew looked at her and thought, There are so many of you, simple village girls, who think that if you just want something badly enough, it will happen, but you need to invest too, but nobody wants to understand that. Carly moved around the house skillfully, tidying up in parallel. Matthew thought, Maybe they need to pay them. Look how hard that girl is working. And maybe another form of payment awaits? He even got excited. Why not? This is an idea. And it won't be boring to stay here. She's a cook and a girl for the night. Everything needs to be thought through. They're all honest but messed up here in the village. And then one thought came to Matthew's mind. There are no guys here. Maybe Carly hasn't even had a boyfriend yet. He even felt a rush of heat. That would be lucky. Carly, do you have a boyfriend? What are you talking about? There's no boyfriend here in the village. The youth doesn't live here. Well, maybe there was before, when you were in school. No, I was studying then, not fooling around. An hour later, the house became much cozier, and dinner was ready too. Would you like to have dinner with me? I hate eating alone. Carly hesitated for a moment, but then answered, Okay, just let me tell my grandma that I'll be late. The girl dashed out of the house, and Matthew headed to his car. He hadn't thought in the store to buy alcohol. But he should have. But at that time, he didn't think that such an interesting idea would come to him. It must be somewhere in his car. He opened the trunk. Right, cognac. And quite good at that. Matthew remembered that it's very easy to drink, but it knocks you off your feet. He'll tell Carly it's a harmless drink. Damn, the label. Matthew rushed back into the house, quickly started opening drawers, and found what he was looking for. A small pitcher with a lid. Grandma, you're a miracle. He rinsed the pitcher, poured the contents of the bottle into it, and hid the empty container, setting the table as if nothing had happened. Candles were even found in one of the drawers, albeit household ones, but that didn't matter. By the time Carly arrived, the table was set. She walked in and gasped. Wow. And after that, you say you can't do anything? I really can't. Cutting cheese before sausage is a big deal. Carly arranged the meat and salad on plates, and they sat down at the table. Then Matthew stood up, as if he had forgotten something. He brought a pitcher and a couple of mugs. Couldn't find shot glasses, Matthew said. Carly smiled. Shot glasses are kept in the big cupboard in the room. They're not kept in the kitchen in the village. Matthew looked at her doubtfully, but still went to check. And indeed, there were many different shot glasses, wine glasses, and even crystal ones. Carly initially refused, but
but Matthew pushed the pitcher towards her. Well, I won't either. What are you saying? Well, okay, just a tiny bit then. They sat. Matthew tried to chat casually, telling funny stories from his life. Carly laughed, and he discreetly kept refilling her shot glass. He could see that the girl was already feeling good, but he didn't let her relax. Finally, Carly tried to get up and realized she couldn't. She looked at Matthew in alarm. He was immediately by her side, lifted her up, kissed her, and Carly wrapped her arms around his neck. In the morning, while he was still asleep, he felt the girl kissing him. So, are we getting married now? He struggled to keep from laughing, but since he still had to stay here for a while, he hugged her and said, Of course, how could you doubt it? Everything was settled. Matthew was fed, the house was clean, and there was always free intimacy with a hot but almost innocent girl. Every day she invited Matthew to meet her grandmother. But Matthew's eyes widened. Are you out of your mind? he asked. She'll ask me how long we've known each other. What do I say? Three days, and she'll take me to task. Carly laughed. There was some truth in Matthew's words. Two weeks had already passed when his father called. So, how are things? Everything's fine. I see, you're doing great. I thought you'd be calling and whining every day. No, Dad, everything's fine, really. Well, you can come back to the city. I've sorted everything out. Wow, that's great news. Just, Matthew, be careful. You know you'll be under a microscope now, right? Yeah, I got it, I got it. He was already packing his things when Carly came. And where are you going? Home. Meaning? Home. And me? You too. Oh, by the way, you can take the fridge with you. It's going to spoil anyway. Carly looked at him intently. Am I understanding correctly? You're leaving us for good? Of course. Do you really think I'd want to stay in the village forever? But you said we'd get married. Matthew put down his bag and approached Carly. Are you really so foolish to think that about me? Marrying a village fool like you? That's just funny, don't you understand? So, all this time you've just been using me? Absolutely right. Here, this is for the work. Matthew placed a hefty stack of money on the table. Carly looked at him. You can't. Goodbye, Carly. We won't see each other again. He dashed out of the house, got into the car, and drove off from the yard without even bothering to close the gates. Carly looked out of the window with dry eyes, then approached the table, threw the money off with a sweep, sat down, and finally burst into tears. It took her a while to calm down, but then she pondered something, approached the window again, stared at the road for a long time, and then said, We won't see each other, you say? Well, we'll see about that. She bent down, felt for the fallen money, then unplugged the refrigerator, gathered everything that was more or less valuable, and headed home. From the threshold, she said, Grandma, we need to sell the house and move to the city. And why is that? I want to open my own bakery, and I will. The old woman shook her head. They had already had such conversations before, but today Carly was determined. And her grandmother had long thought that something needed to be done to give her granddaughter a chance. After all, she herself was already old. So they started getting ready, or rather, started selling everything. Their house was good, and they got a good price for it, too. Carly understood perfectly well that if she failed, they would have nowhere to return. In three weeks, they managed. Carly found a small house on the outskirts through an ad and called the landlady. Of course, 
Houses in the city were much more expensive. But Matthew had thrown money at her like a dog. And the amount there was even a bit more than what they got for the house. In the beginning, Carly walked around the city, looked around, and inquired. Meanwhile, her grandmother was creating coziness. She wasn't even disappointed. Well, yes, the house was smaller, and there was no garden, you could say it didn't exist. But there was gas, hot and cold water, and no need to heat the stove. Oh, she strained herself with all that firewood. Her husband died early. She rested a little while her son was around. But then he and his fiancée died early too. They fell through the ice while fishing. And she was alone. There was no money to hire anyone. Carly wraps up warmer and goes to the forest while the other one sits on the sled. She saws firewood, then drags it home. And so, you could say, all winter, to save up for the next one. Soon Carly smiled at her luck. The owner of one of the shops agreed to try her pastries. If they liked it, they would take it for sale. Well, and maybe something else after that. Carly enthusiastically got to work. She really hoped that after pies, there would come a time for cakes, cookies. She bought everything she needed, including a good oven. Grandma secretly crossed herself when Carly took on the first order. Half a year later, Carly's baking was already supplying seven stores. And the girl had to look for an assistant. That's where Grandma helped. Carly, you're always busy, and I, an old woman, am bored. Sometimes I go out for a walk. Two houses down from us lives Mrs. Izzy. She's a good old lady. She has a granddaughter. She'll be finishing school soon. The girl's parents aren't very good. She doesn't even live with them. So, Mrs. Izzy said she's looking for a side job. She wants to save up for something the young folks need. Maybe you could try? I don't know, Grandma. What if she can't do anything? Well, don't promise her anything right away. Just try. Well, okay, there's no time to look for anyone anyway. Tell her to come around 5 o'clock. We'll take a look at her. So they got Erlen in their house. Erlen couldn't sit still for a second. But it must be admitted that everything was on fire in the hands of the slender girl. Carly couldn't be happier with her. And Erlen, when Carly gave her her first paycheck in the first week, almost cried. I'll work hard. I promise. And she kept her promise. After school, she did her homework and ran to Carly's, and when it was vacation time, she would spend whole days at their place. Carly felt relieved, no matter what. But Erlen was a great help. Once, when they were drinking tea while the pies were baking in the oven, Erlen asked, Carly, why don't you open your own bakery? You're practically baking for seven stores alone. If you opened your own shop, you'd make more profit. And then even more and more. Erlen's eyes sparkled dreamily. Carly laughed. Well, you've got me there. What stores? I don't understand any of this. Well, nobody does. I'll bring you some books from the school library. Ah, uh, if only we had a laptop. Carly looked thoughtfully at Erlen. And if we had a laptop, then what? What do you mean, then what? The girl even jumped up. You can post a bunch of ads. Even with pictures. You can find all the information on how to start your own business. You can find everything on the internet. That's what it's for. Carly pondered. She herself understood that she was working the old-fashioned way. And though she wasn't making so little money, she even managed to save up for something. But if she understood how to do it more profitably, well, that would be a whole different story. 
and she had also thought about getting a laptop. But her knowledge of such technology ended with knowing how to turn it on. She looked at Erlen. Do you know how to do all that on a laptop? Carly, who doesn't know how to do that nowadays? You crack me up. Well, then, why are you sitting around? Erlen looked at her in surprise. What do I need to do? Get ready, we're going to buy a laptop. The girl was speechless. Really? Yeah, let's go, finish your tea. While Ellen finished her tea, Carly found out that they definitely needed to take along the neighbor and, coincidentally, Ellen's friend, Brody. He knows about this stuff. You know how smart he is? And when it comes to the internet, laptops, he's a real. Is he your boyfriend or something? Erlen blushed. Well, not exactly. We're friends. He's 18, and Grandma says he's not right for me. Why? Well, why not? I'm small, and he's big. In terms of age? Yeah, he's already 18, and I'm only 16. Carly laughed. Yeah, that's quite a difference. Call your Brody. By evening they returned. Carly admitted that Erlen's friend really knew everything about the internet. Her head was spinning like a drum. In the last few hours, so much information had entered her that Carly no longer understood anything. Matthew had been in the director's post for three years now. Of course, his father still appeared very often, giving advice, telling stories, but Matthew was sure he could handle it himself. Honestly, he was very annoyed by these instructions. It's not such a huge business here to manage it together. Actually, Matthew's thoughts were that they needed to expand, and very seriously. Well, what is this, a big city, and they only have five stores? Even though his father called them a chain, what kind of chain was it? What if they had 20 or 30? Even better, if they were in different cities. He talked about this with his father. And he seemed not to be against it, but he was very cautious. You see, Matthew, we have our own clientele now. People who have been coming to our stores for many years. The people who go to them, they know and love our products. And then, you know, finding a good pastry chef, it's very difficult. Dad, you could organize a contest. You could, Matthew, you could do anything, but you have to think everything over ten times. Nowadays there are a lot of young and rash ones. One wrong step, and that's it, they'll eat you up without even looking at the fact that you've been respected here for a long time. Matthew was very annoyed by such conversations. He absolutely understood nothing about baking, but it seemed to him that he understood business much better. Moreover, he had the idea that he needed to become a deputy, then all the doors would open much easier. This smart thought was prompted by the father of his fiancée. He also had stores, only fish ones. He had been a deputy for several years, and Matthew immediately explained that business goes uphill when you have some power in your hands. Honestly, Matthew wasn't against taking over both businesses. That's when he would feel good. That's why he chose Angel for a fiancé. The girl was very short, but had very round shapes. Matthew was disgusted by her, but Angel's dad promised to help, and he really needed the help. So she had to smile and even sleep sometimes. Matthew, of course, hoped that it wouldn't come to marriage, so he hurried to do everything quickly. Mr. Matthew, here's the report for last week. Yes, Bertie, leave it. Bertie put down the report and went to the exit, gracefully swaying her hips. Matthew smiled. Oh, if only he had a wife like Bertie, and beautiful at that. And in bed, it was just fire. But Bertie was his secretary, so that option was out. 
He glanced at the report. His eyebrows shot up. He quickly grabbed the phone. Hello, Mrs. Louise? Who the hell made this report? Did you see what's in it? Mr. Matthew, please don't shout. I made the report, double-checked it several times. The income for this week is meager, and at this rate, we'll soon be operating at a loss. How can this be? Everything was fine, and now this? Mr. Matthew, if you were dealing with the company's affairs instead of your love affairs, you would have noticed that our profits have been falling for the past three months. Slowly, but surely. I provide you with a report every week. Matthew hung up the phone. What's this? Why? We need to figure this out. He pressed the button. Bertie, quickly get everyone to my office. Announce an emergency meeting. Matthew knew that new pastry shops had appeared in the city over a year ago. They were called Carly's. So, the pastries in these shops were much cheaper and two orders of magnitude tastier. Matthew was furious. Why didn't anyone report this to me? What should we do now? They need to be shut down. How will you shut them down? Everything is in order with their documents. Everything is clean everywhere. This can't be happening. Why not? They say even the mayor himself drinks coffee there. The mayor? That's even worse. And that's not all. They say the mayor's son is courting the owner. If they get together, then we're finished. Is the owner a girl? Matthew didn't notice his father entering the office. So, son, did you blow the business? Dad, nobody is insured against this. Grown-ups, Matthew, crush competitors at the embryonic stage. And you missed it all. And now fix the situation however you want. Go to this girl, kneel down, beg her to stay in her half of the city. Me? Well, not me. And you better hurry. Matthew was fuming, the thought of bowing down to someone, but he realized there was no other way. He needed to negotiate, or he would end up with nothing. He asked Bertie to track down the phone number of that owner and set up a meeting for him. An hour later, Bertie said they would be waiting for him at 7 in the evening at the new restaurant. This restaurant was also a headache for Matthew. He had been there a couple of times and had seen the grandeur of it all. He saw how many people were in the restaurant and mentally calculated the income. It was an insanely beautiful amount. And honestly, even his teeth ached at the thought that it wasn't his profit. At exactly seven, he walked into the restaurant. A waiter approached him immediately. Mr. Matthew? Yes. I'll take you to your table. Matthew was seated at a table separated from the main hall by a beaded screen. What can I get you? Coffee and a hundred grams of cognac, Matthew replied, feeling himself getting worked up. He wasn't used to waiting, he was used to being waited for. He knew he shouldn't be drinking, but he couldn't help himself. Good evening, Mr. Matthew. A beautiful, well-groomed girl sat opposite him, looking about 27 or 28. There was something vaguely familiar about her, and suddenly Matthew recognized her. Carly? What the hell are you doing here? How did you find me? The girl smiled. Matthew, you're flattering yourself. I wasn't looking for you. And I didn't particularly want to see you. You wanted to meet with me. Me? Are you out of your mind? You do look great, but I wasn't looking to meet with you. And then it dawned on him. Wait, at Carly's. Are you the owner of those new bakeries? Carly smiled. Her smile was just like it was several years ago. I am. Surprised? Not bad for a country bumpkin, huh? 
Matthew felt his palms sweating. This can't be. What the hell? Are you doing all this on purpose to get back at me? Oh, Matthew, how can someone be so self-centered? I didn't know your family was in the same business. If you remember, you never told me about it, and you didn't even give me your last name. Only today, when they said you wanted to meet, did I look you up online to see who was bothering me? You know, I would have declined if it were someone else in your place. But to look you in the eyes and hear what you have to say was quite interesting. So, asking you to stay out of the riverside part of the city is pointless now? Now it is. Are the bodyguards good? The cognac was getting to his head, and Matthew knew he was heading in the wrong direction, but he couldn't stop himself. Well, you're a real piece of work, you country bumpkin, got it? Carly raised her hand, and instantly, a waiter was by their side. Fabio, call security. This young man wants to leave our restaurant. Fabio disappeared instantly while Matthew was about to lunge at her, but was immediately intercepted by strong arms. He was literally carried out of the restaurant and set down on the ground. Matthew felt angry and humiliated. He turned towards the restaurant and made an obscene gesture towards the departing guards. At that moment, he noticed his father's car. His father was looking at him, shook his head, rolled up the window, and drove off.